advising the military how to recognize the UFOs, how to report them, and how to handle fragments of them. Are the flying saucers really solid objects? The Canadian government says it has borrowed pieces of flying saucers from the U.S. Air Force. The government of Brazil collected several ounces of tin, which dripped from a UFO onto the city of Campinas. The Norwegian government reported in 1952 that it had located and recovered the outer shell of a UFO, which, it said, was certainly not made on this earth. Slowly but surely, the irrefutable facts about UFOs have filtered through the veil of censorship in this and other countries. Slowly but surely, the nature and extent of this remarkable phenomenon has become public knowledge. By patiently piecing together these bits of evidence as they become available, by carefully weighing the guarded statements of scientists and military agencies involved in the study of unidentified flying objects, we shall see that they are indeed serious business. What should we do about them? What can we do about them? Let us consider the case of the Argentine naval transport, the Punta Madanos, which was making its way across the South Atlantic near the Falkland Islands in September of 1963. An enormous craft of unknown type and origin approached the naval transport from astern. The officers of the transport estimated that the object was about 800 feet in diameter. It was gray in color, like dull aluminum, and in shape it resembled two huge soup bowls placed together rim to rim. As the strange craft approached, slowly and silently, and about 100 feet above the sea, the Punta Madanos compass gyrated wildly. The lights went out. The intercommunication system went dead. The radar and radio ceased to function. The ship was virtually helpless. For 20 minutes, this state of affairs continued, and then the strange aerial craft rose ponderously into the heavens and vanished as mysteriously as it had come. This is not an unusual case, let it be noted. The Secretary of the Argentine Navy says this was but one of 13 such cases in which giant UFOs had interfered with the operation of Argentine naval craft in a three-year period. hostility in their actions, but there was unquestionably a powerful electromagnetic field which overwhelmed man-made gear while the UFOs were near. The captain of the Punta Madanos found that he could do nothing while his vessel was within the field of the giant UFO. It was an experience that has been shared by many persons in the air, on the ground, and at sea. The captain of the Punta Madanos was as helpless as, for instance, our own astronaut, Major Gordon Cooper. As Major Cooper was making his final orbit of the Earth in May of 1963, he was approaching Perth, Australia at night. Suddenly, Major Cooper radioed down to the tracking station that he was being approached by a greenish glowing disk with a faint red glow on one side. It was traveling east to west, which no man-made satellite does. 200 persons at the tracking station watched the object on the gear there. They saw it approach Cooper. Then it veered away from him and sped on out into space. It was only the first of many such cases. Every American astronaut since Gordon Cooper has also been approached by unidentified flying objects. And each time the UFOs come closer to the astronauts, and each time they remain a little longer. In 1965, Major Edward McDivitt photographed one of these objects near the capsule in which he was orbiting the Earth over the Pacific Ocean. And the photograph, as released by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, clearly shows a bright egg-shaped thing which leaves a visible trail from its propulsion system. The astronauts have all been approached by UFOs. One of our surveyor shots to the moon was followed by UFOs, according to NASA. These things have caused power blackouts by official admission. Individuals have been burned by radiation when they got too close to UFOs. And mid-air collisions with planes full of passengers and near collisions as well can also be found in the reports around the world. These incidents are but a small part of the worldwide story of what we officially call unidentified flying objects. In their early form, they were called flying saucers 
which they did resemble in flight. But as the old saucer or disc-shaped types were gradually replaced by more sophisticated models, the term unidentified flying object was officially adopted. It could and did include all types of craft and objects. And the objects themselves did and still do constitute a major problem for the government of the United States and of many other nations around the world, including Russia, which was first to become aware of their presence. In May of 1946, residents of northwestern Russia, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark were startled by a rash of unconventional objects which darted about in the skies. At first, these things were referred to in the news dispatches as ghost rockets, but it soon became evident that they were certainly not rockets. They changed direction. They were seen to hover. They were silent, and they left no rocket trail. And when the jets were sent up after them, the things simply zipped away at fantastic speed and left the jets far behind. That was in May of 1946. It was just one year after man had exploded his first atomic device. Was there any relationship between those two historic events? Or was it pure coincidence? Did the flash and the powerful radiation of those atomic explosions attract the attention of something or somebody out there in space? If so, who or what and from where? Scientists and military men were still pondering those questions in the late summer of 1946 when the weird objects vanished as suddenly as they had appeared. In June of 1947, they were back. This time, they were over the northwestern part of the continental United States. First, there was only a handful of them, but their numbers grew rapidly and their activities expanded. A study of their actions led to the conclusion that they were definitely interested in the capabilities of our various vehicles. They paced our planes and our trains and our automobiles and our ships and our submarines. One of them appears to have been involved in a bizarre incident, which is a matter of record with the United States Navy. This occurred in the summer of 1947, when the battleship New York was on patrol in the North Pacific. The gear picked up an object which seemed to be following the battleship. Presently, as the skies cleared, the object could be seen with the naked eye and could be examined through binoculars. It was some kind of faintly glowing disc or spherical thing moving in the same direction and at about the same speed as the battleship. The radar had it for several hours, as did the rangefinders for the guns. At length, when the thing could still be seen the next morning, the battleship opened fire, first with the five-inch guns, later with the big 14-inch rifles. When this cannonade was finished, the object was gone. There was no indication that it had been hit. When the official report was made by the commander of the battleship New York, the refutation was promptly issued that they had only been shooting at the planet Venus. Thus, as far back as 1947, the official policy of issuing explanations which ignored the facts was in evidence. For one thing, the object which followed the battleship New York was in the wrong direction to have been the planet Venus. It did not change position relative to either the ship or the horizon, as a planet would have done. And perhaps most important and most devastating to the official explanation, neither the radar nor the rangefinders on the battleship could possibly have picked up the planet Venus or any other planet. If this was indeed the first case of deriding those who reported unconventional objects in the sky, it was but the forerunner of many similar cases. And it was also the forerunner of many cases in which human beings have tried to do violence to UFOs, perhaps a common human reaction to something they do not understand. Many centuries ago, when several great shining silvery disks dived out of the sky toward the troops of Alexander the Great as the troops were fording a river, most of the soldiers fled the scene. But some of the hardier men stood their ground and tried to hit the disks with their arrows and with stones from their slings. In April of 1897, when a glowing red dirigible-shaped object indicated that it was about to touch down, 
in a cattle lot on the farm of Alexander Hamilton near Leroy, Kansas, Hamilton and his teenage son and his hired man armed themselves with axes and rushed toward the craft. It quickly rose into the air out of reach, taking with it the hideous creatures which the men reportedly saw in the brightly lighted cabin beneath the craft. Peasants who worked in a beet field in northern Italy reported to the police that when a disc-shaped UFO hovered over them at very low altitude, shortly before dark one evening in 1954, they pelted it with clods and stones, and one man struck it a ringing blow with his shovel. On the night of April 18, 1962, a glowing red object was sighted by a ground observer group at Oneida, New York. They immediately notified the military at a nearby airbase, and the thing was picked up on radar. It was tracked by radar as it moved westward across the country to a point near Gridley, Kansas. Then it changed course and descended until it was below the range of the radar. A few minutes later, an unidentified flying object landed near an electric power substation at Eureka, Utah. While the object was close to the station, the station could not function. The military went into action promptly and scrambled two flights of armed jet interceptors, one from Phoenix, Arizona, the other from Reno, Nevada. The object remained on the ground near the power substation for 42 minutes, according to military spokesmen. As the jets approached, the object took flight, and the electric power again flowed through that substation. Pursued by armed jets, the object streaked across southwestern Nevada, and it exploded in flight about 70 miles south of Reno over the Mesquite Range. The brilliant flash lighted the city of Reno like a giant photographer's flash bulb, according to the witnesses. The military sources admitted that the object had exploded, but they refused to say whether it was the result of action by the pursuing jets. An interesting case is one which occurred one evening in October of 1954 near Milan, Italy, when a crowd gathered to watch a dimly glowing UFO which had settled down in an abandoned sports field. The witnesses later told authorities that they had stopped a passing garbage truck and had armed themselves with part of its spoiled fruit, which they threw at the craft and its occupants, scoring several hits, they said, before it rose and fled. If this was indeed an extraterrestrial spacecraft with living occupants, it must have been very disconcerting for them to cross millions of miles of space only to be hit on the head with rotten oranges. The dramatic advent of such fascinating objects as those which were first called flying saucers attracted the inevitable attention of those individuals who let their imaginations run away with their veracity. By 1950, some of these characters were beginning to spin their stories of fantastic conversations with alleged space people. Some of them expanded the stories to include alleged rides in the UFOs. Others published books replete with photographs of what they blandly called spacecraft, motherships and all. Because they all claimed to have made contact with the operators of the UFOs, the promoters of these various stories are known as contactees. One of the most famous and the most successful was a fellow who had very limited schooling, but unlimited imagination. He concocted an engrossing tale of his alleged conversation with a gorgeous female space traveler from some distant planet. He also concocted some pictures which the Air Force experts promptly identified as what they called simulated, which indicated charitable restraint on their part, to say the least. This charming fellow voluntarily listed his book with the Library of Congress as a piece of fiction, but he sold the book to the general public as a factual account. I was fascinated by one of his pictures, which he identified as the craft in which he said he had made a trip to another planet. It took me eight years to track down the object which he called a spaceship. It was the top of a canister-type vacuum cleaner made in 1937. Somehow, I doubt that very much space travel is actually being done in vacuum cleaner lids. Of course, Mr. Edwards was referring to George Adamski, famous contactee from the early 1950s. Every student of unidentified flying objects quickly discovers that this present development is but the latest phase of a very old phenomenon. 
The Bible contains numerous references to strange objects, variously described in terms of contemporary understanding. Ezekiel's wheels of fire were probably his description of what would have been great glowing disks, for wheels in his day were solid circles. The account of Lot in the Bible tells how he saw strange beings who came down from the heavens and who even ate at his table. The Bible contains many references, but those it contains are but a small portion of the reports which scholars have found in various ancient chronicles. One of these is very old indeed. It is the books of Zion, which are the written version of the legends of the hill people of northern India. For thousands of years, these accounts were handed down from generation to generation by word of mouth until at last they were preserved in writing in the form in which they exist today. The account to which I refer is that which purports to describe a singular event in the history of those ancient people. The time of the incident was about 6,000 years before the Christian era, yet some of its details have been known to modern science for less than 20 years. The legend tells how strange glistening metallic vessels were seen in the skies of northern India. After circling the earth, so we are told, these craft landed, and the awestruck natives fell down before the men who got out of the vessels. In a short time, the visitors became the rulers of these people, and they built two cities from which they ruled for many years. The people prospered under their rulership, and all went well until a grievous misunderstanding arose between the two groups of visitors. Then, says the Chronicle, one leader took a group of his companions and they rose into the sky in one of their huge vessels. They flew to a point from which they could see the city in which their opponents dwelt. Then they released what the Chronicle describes as a great shining lance which rode on a beam of light. This weapon exploded in or above the doomed city. The flash blinded all who gazed upon it and burned those in and about the city for a great distance. The water of the river was poisoned by the explosion, and the dust of the city was also poisoned, so that none dared enter. When the visitor who had launched this attack realized the enormity of the devastation, he gathered about him the remnants of his own people, put them into the remaining vessels, and rose into the sky, never to return. The devastated city eventually crumbled and vanished. The other city was finally abandoned and fell into ruins. This account sounds very much like an early attempt by space beings to establish a base or a foothold on Earth. It notes that these creatures circled the Earth, and that was at a time when humans were of the belief that the Earth was flat. The description of a great shining lance that rode on a beam of light bears a striking resemblance to a modern rocket with its flaming exhaust, described by those who had never seen such a thing before. And the great flash that burned and blinded and poisoned the dust and the water bears an ominous similarity to a detailed description of a nuclear blast and its aftermath. Yet, all this was said to have taken place many thousands of years ago, and for men of that time to have imagined such things in such detail would be more fantastic than the story itself. The chronicles of ancient India, in this case, merely add mystery to an enigma. If it did not occur, as stated, then how did they know about such things in such precise and accurate detail? And if it did happen, as described, who were the strange visitors who sailed their metal ships in the skies of Earth almost 8,000 years before man learned to fly? In or about the year 956 A.D., the records of an ancient church in Ireland tell of a weird incident which defies explanation other than some early type UFO. It tells how the people attending church were alarmed by a loud crashing noise. They rushed out to find a metal anchor hooked in the wood above the front door of the church. The anchor was at the end of a cable which ran up to a strange craft hovering in the air a short distance above the church and a man-like creature who was apparently trying to dislodge the anchor was seized when he endeavored to climb back up the cable. But the bishop who wrote the report for his superiors said that he made the parishioners turn the creature loose for fear they might harm him, and that upon being freed, the creature hastily climbed the cable, which was then cut 
and the craft sped away in the skies. The anchor, says the old church record, was kept in the church for many years as a souvenir of the incident. In January of 1910, the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee, was surprised by the visit of a large dirigible-shaped craft which cruised about over the city in broad daylight for about half an hour in full view of thousands of people, many of whom were admittedly frightened by it. In those days, the only similar devices known to man were a few clumsy, underpowered Zeppelins in Europe, totally incapable of visiting this country. Next day, the object was back over Chattanooga, and then it rose into the clouds and moved away toward the south. Another well-attested enigma in the long, long story of the unidentified flying objects. When you hear the statement that no professional astronomer has ever seen a flying saucer, you are entitled to reply, malarkey, for that's exactly what it is. The first UFOs ever photographed were seen and filmed by Professor Bonilla at the observatory at Zacatecas, Mexico on August the 12th, 1883. He and his colleagues saw hundreds of spindle-shaped craft in formation passing between their telescope and the sun on that and the succeeding day. More recently, let us consider the case of Dr. Clyde Tombaugh, who is world famous as the discoverer of the planet Pluto. In 1949, Dr. Tombaugh and several other witnesses, including members of his family, watched a strange cigar-shaped craft with regularly spaced rectangular apertures along the sides, similar in appearance to windows, as the craft moved silently about over the desert near Tombaugh's home in New Mexico. The noted astronomer said in a written statement that he had the impression that the object was some form of extraterrestrial device. Dr. Seymour Hess of Lowell Observatory also saw a UFO and had the courage to report what he had seen. It was on May the 20th, 1950. Dr. Hess described a shiny double convex disc which he had watched maneuvering about in the clear sky of the southwest. It was completely unlike any other object he had ever seen, with or without the aid of a telescope. One of the most famous astronomers of our time was the late Dr. H. Percy Wilkins, famed among other things for his leadership of the British Selenological Society as a result of his lifelong study of the moon. On June the 11th, 1954, Dr. Wilkins was in this country on a speaking trip and he was flying in a convair from Charleston, West Virginia to Atlanta, Georgia. The weather was good with scattered clouds and bright sunshine. When Dr. Wilkins arrived at Atlanta, he held a press conference at which he described an unusual experience which he had had during that flight. He said that he had been looking out the window where he was seated near the rear of the plane when he noticed two large coppery looking disks darting in and out of the clouds. They were near enough that he could discern certain details which indicate that he was seeing the double convex type UFO, which was just beginning to replace the earlier type disc, or so-called flying saucer. Dr. Wilkins described what he had seen to the reporters in Atlanta, and when asked if he had any idea what the objects were, he replied, and I quote him, I certainly do. I saw two flying saucers, end quote. Frank Halstead, who was for 25 years the curator of the University of Minnesota Observatory at Duluth, says that he has seen a total of three UFOs, two of them in one day and almost at the same time. No professional astronomer ever saw a flying saucer? The record indicates otherwise. The time, one o'clock on the morning of September 4th, 1965. Two sheriff's deputies from the office at Angleton had stopped their car on the highway a few miles from Damon, Texas. Their attention had been attracted by a peculiar purplish light which they had seen in the sky off to one side of the road. They got out of their car to observe it better. A moment later, they got back into the car to get away from there quicker. The purple light was some sort of brilliant spotlight on the front of a strange football-shaped craft somewhere in excess of 90 feet long. As the two officers stood there beside their car, the object had turned toward them, caught them in its light, and then dived toward them. The officers roared down the highway toward Damon, and the object easily kept pace with them. At times, their speed exceeded 100 miles an hour, according to their report. 
but the big craft continued to follow. They finally lost it near Damon and then went back out to take another look at it and were again pursued. This incident at Damon, Texas occurred only a few minutes after police officers at Exeter, New Hampshire had watched a similar craft carrying brilliant red lights. It had terrified several people and the police who saw it admittedly felt squeamish about their experience. The type of craft described in these incidents is one of about half a dozen frequently reported. First, the so-called saucers, which appeared in 1946 over northwestern Europe. This was followed about 1953 by the double convex type, resembling two soup bowls rim to rim, and later the football-shaped things in many sizes. We must also include the occasional cigar-shaped devices and the giant spherical things with rims around their equators. There are a few others of various shapes reported from time to time, but these are the types most frequently seen and photographed by credible witnesses. As they vary in shape, so do they vary in size. Presumably, this is due to the difference in purpose, just as our own satellites come in many shapes and sizes for different types of performance. An Air Force colonel flying over the Pacific during the Korean War reported that a shiny little disc not more than six or eight inches in diameter played around over the wing of his jet, suddenly spurted ahead and made the same maneuver around the jet ahead of him, then streaked away and vanished. From that tiny six inch device or object, the UFOs have been reported up to around a thousand feet in diameter. In such cases, the big ones are always of the double convex type. The pilot, co-pilot, and three military aviation experts on a charter flight from Anchorage, Alaska to Tokyo in the winter of 1964 reported that they had been paced over the North Pacific by three double convex type craft about 1,000 feet in diameter. They could detect no visible indication of propulsion, nor did they see any operators in the transparent domes on the top center of the objects. But the UFOs easily eluded the plane's efforts to close with them and gave every indication of being highly maneuverable and under intelligent control. When last seen, the UFOs were going straight up at a speed estimated around 1,300 miles per hour. Now, since the witnesses in this case were experts in both aeronautics and rocketry, their testimony carries unusual weight. Such remarkable performance characteristics as those we have just described implies a power source of tremendous potential. The answer may be found in the statement of Dr. Hermann Oberth, the famed rocket scientist who led an investigation of UFOs for the West German government. In June of 1954, Dr. Oberth told newsmen at Frankfurt, Germany, that he and his fellow scientists had concluded that the UFOs were powered by some method of converting gravity into usable energy. Theoretically, such a process would give the UFOs or any other spacecraft an endless source of power since gravity is known to exist throughout the entire universe. Thus far, man has not been able to determine precisely what it is or exactly how it works, nor how to put it to work. But we are not idle. Since the time of Dr. Oberth's statement, the United States has embarked on a costly and intensive program of gravitational research. True Magazine reported in January of 1960 that we had, at that time, 46 separate gravitational research programs underway. And it may well be that Dr. Oberth's assertion that men would be going to the moon in electrically propelled craft by 1970 will be fulfilled. We have found that gravity can be used. There remains the problem of learning how to do it. In 1964, our Ranger 7 sent back thousands of pictures before it crashed into the moon. Ranger 8 did even better, both in quantity and quality. But very few pictures from that second group were ever exposed to public gaze. And those pictures should have been very interesting for they were centered on that area around the crater Aristarchus, where so many phenomena have been noted and where the phenomena are still being noted for that matter. 
The story of man's interest in lunar phenomena was dramatically intensified by a series of events which may not have been related. And then again, perhaps they were. Here is that story. Dr. Asaph Hall discovered in one six-day period in 1877 that the planet Mars had two moons where no moons had ever been seen before. Moreover, the moons of Mars were brighter than the planet itself, as though they were of different material. And one of the moons revolves around the planet in an orbit unlike any other natural satellite, if that's what it is. Two years after Dr. Hall's historic discoveries, the British Astronomical Society was deluged with reports of strange lights on the moon in the dark part of the lunar orb. So many astronomers reported so many anomalies that the society began to wonder if there was somebody up there and if they were trying to make us aware of their presence by arranging lights in geometric patterns. The society requested that its members chart and report any and all such oddities on the moon in the hope that some sort of intelligible signals might be discovered. Well, they got a lot more than they bargained for. Between 1879 and 1882, the Astronomical Society received more than 2,000 reports of light patterns on the dark part of the moon. They received so many reports that they had to ask their members to refrain from making any additional reports. The society was unable to cope with what it already had. In the summer of 1965, moon watching had become fashionable once more for professional astronomers. They began to notice occasional flashes of intensely bright white light from the floor of the crater Aristarchus. Several observatories were linked by shortwave radio stations so that the instant any one of them saw this curious light, the other observatories were notified. This project was called Astronet and it recorded those flashes many times in the year 1965 and as a result, the number of observatories involved was increased in 1966, and also the results. Still another oddity known to exist on the moon is that of the objects called moon domes. These are circular white hemispherical spots which are at just about the limit of telescopic visibility. They're probably 600 feet in diameter. It was once thought that these things were hills or perhaps tiny volcanic cones. But subsequent study revealed that the mysterious domes sometimes vanished in one area and appeared later in another. What they were and why they seemed to be hopscotching around on the bleak lunar surface, no man can say. One of the most baffling lunar anomalies was the gigantic bridge-like structure first reported in the early 1950s by John O'Neill who described the thing as looking like an enormous bridge with a span at least 12 miles long. O'Neill, who was then the respected science editor of the New York Herald Tribune, received the scornful response he had expected, but it dissipated rapidly when famed British selenologist Dr. H. Percy Wilkins reported seeing the same thing just one month after O'Neill's discovery. Shortly afterward, the bridge, or whatever it was, vanished from the Maracrisium, or at least it vanished from the sight of man. Major Patrick Powers, long a top man of the Army Space Development Program, said that the first men to the moon must be prepared to fight for the privilege of landing. Dr. Carl Sagan, advisor on extraterrestrial life to the armed services, said in December of 1962, that man must be prepared to face the probability that we have already been visited by beings from elsewhere in the universe and that these beings have, or have had, bases on the averted side of the moon from where they could easily see us but where we could not see them. Does this help to explain our $20 billion rush to put men on the moon? Does it explain the Russians' repeated efforts to photograph the averted side of the moon. Is the moon already a way station for space travel, just as we hope to use it ourselves someday? At this period in human affairs, no man has the answers to those questions 
but the waiting period is rapidly drawing to a close. Twelve glowing disc-shaped UFOs came over the city of Washington, D.C. on the night of July 19, 1952. They were tracked on radar. They were seen by a great many people. They flew in formation around the White House and the Capitol building and over the Pentagon. They insult supreme. Most of the objects were gone by the time the first jets arrived. For the jets, which were supposed to protect the city of Washington, had been on patrol over Delaware where a huge UFO was hovering at great altitude. This incident made worldwide headlines, of course. Here was the capital of the world's major power, being visited by alien craft of unknown origin and finding the military powerless to deal with the development. There were three Washington incidents of this type, the one just mentioned, another on July 25th, and the biggest of all on the night of August 13, 1952, when the Civil Aeronautics Administration reported that a total of 68 UFOs were present over the District of Columbia during that one night. But the military acted promptly when the UFOs got to Washington. They had a difficult choice to make. They either had to admit what was known about the UFOs or to pretend there was nothing up there while they tried to find an answer. And that was the choice they made. And it was a good choice at the time. The order which imposes the strict censorship on the subject of UFOs is a regulation which came from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, or higher. It is known as JNAP 146, which means Joint Army-Navy-Air Publication Number 146. This concludes the other military services and requires them to channel their UFO reports to the Air Force. This is the order which specifies that the Air Force shall make all the UFO investigations and shall make all the press statements on the subject. It also specifically provides that the Air Force can tell the public only that the UFOs are conventional objects or conditions. Fortunately, that order was not immediately classified and a few copies of it got out before the censors placed it on the classified list and prevented the public knowing of its existence. Thus, as a result of the aerial invasion of Washington, D.C. by unidentified flying objects in July and August of 1952, we embarked on an official policy which still remains in force. It was a wise policy at its inception, but time and events have passed it by. Under the conditions of the censorship regulation, the Air Force tried to carry out its orders, but it was a difficult assignment at best, and in the long run, an impossible task. The section which required the Air Force to identify these things to the public only as conventional objects or conditions finally led to the breakdown of the entire censorship program, an almost inevitable turn of events. For as more and more credible witnesses around the world reported more and more UFOs, the official protestations that these people were seeing nothing more than swarms of luminous flying ants or searchlights on the clouds began to lose their appeal. The first major rift between the censors and the press came in the summer of 1965 when tens of thousands of people in the Great Plains states watched weird formations of colored lights maneuvering around in the skies from the Dakotas to the Mexican border. The things were seen on radar. They were seen through binoculars and with the naked eye. They were seen following planes. They were photographed both by amateurs and professionals. But next day, when the news services called on the Air Force investigators for an explanation, they were told that the lights had been nothing more than four stars in the constellation Orion. Astronomers promptly denounced that as an impossibility, since that constellation was on the other side of the Earth at the time of the sightings. Hundreds of irate editors loosed their barbs at the Air Force for this boo-boo. Yet, under the circumstances, it was probably as good as anything they could have offered under the restrictions. The final breakdown of the censorship program occurred early in 1966, when hundreds of students and police and faculty members of the University of Michigan watched four and sometimes five glowing football-shaped objects maneuvering at low altitude in that area. 
a farmer and his son told authorities that they had seen one of the things on the ground and had been close enough to see that it had a sort of waffled surface and that it was football shaped. The official explanation was offered after a very brief investigation, only a couple of hours and three or four interviews. Then the public was told that these people had been seeing swamp gas. There was no swamp involved. The temperature was too low for the gas to have formed, and the light breeze was capable of dissipating the gas even had it existed. The net result of this fiasco was that swamp gas became a national joke, and the Air Force found itself not only discredited, but facing congressional investigation. And all of this because it had merely been trying to carry out orders. As far as the censorship program was concerned, the damage had been done. The nature and existence of the censorship was painfully obvious. Editors resented it and said so, hundreds of them. One television network ran a program which seemed anxious to present the official side in the best possible light, which was certainly not an easy task. On that particular program, one participant was permitted to make the unchallenged declaration that no UFOs were ever sighted on radar. That statement was in direct contradiction to the facts, which include a book on radar sightings of UFOs compiled by the Civil Aviation Administration. Another claim made on that same broadcast was that none of our tracking cameras had photographed any UFOs. Robin Sanford, for more than 10 years an official of that particular program, says that from 12 to 15 percent of the tracking station camera pictures include unidentified aerial objects. By the end of 1965, the UFO cat was pretty well out of the bag of censorship. Since there had been no hostility by the UFOs, scientists contended that it was not a military concern, but a matter for scientific investigation, which seemed more logical than most suggestions. Let's discuss the fascinating riddle of signals from outer space. In this category, we must also include such items as our own nuclear explosions, for their byproduct of that incredibly brilliant flash and their radiation, which would be detectable at much greater distances than the flash itself, may very well have served notice on other residents of the cosmos that the dwellers on this tiny planet of ours are learning to use the fury of the split atom, that in a relatively short time we would be able to move about in space, just as others have evidently been doing before us. This may explain the dramatic appearance of unidentified flying objects in May of 1946, one year after man exploded his first nuclear device. But there had been other indications of life out there, both before and after the 1946 UFO visitation. And in that other evidence which I mention, there seems to be a pattern of sorts, a time interval which may give us a clue to our nearest neighbors in space. Let us take note of the details of this strange business. Nikola Tesla sent out tremendously powerful radio signals in 1899, signals that were little more than man-made lightning bolts delivered in measured sequence. They could be picked up at great distance from the Earth, if anybody was listening. Marconi picked up strange signals from space exactly 22 years later. The origin of those signals was and is unknown. But the really interesting factor here is that 22-year sequence between powerful man-made signals and signals from outer space. In 1924, when the planet Mars came within 35 million miles of the Earth, the United States Navy hired scientists to record radio signals on photographic paper which moved through a special machine. The antennas were turned toward Mars. Signals came in. When the sensitized paper was developed, it showed unintelligible strings of dots and dashes but it also showed clumps of signals which resembled crude caricatures of human faces. There was no explanation then, and there is none now. 
That was in 1924. 22 years later, the UFOs swarmed over northwestern Europe and began their systematic surveillance of man and his works. And more radio signals kept trickling in, fragmentary signals, and 22 years old when we got them back from somewhere. In more recent years, many countries have built huge radio telescopes. Those telescopes, and especially those at Green Bank, West Virginia, have devoted and are devoting a great deal of time and scientific manpower to the study of two particular stars, Tau Ceti and Epsilon Iridini. Some of the incoming signals were so startling and perhaps so important that a special secret meeting of experts in this field was held to discuss the findings, whatever they were. Why all this special attention to those two stars, Tau Ceti and Epsilon Iridini? Could it be due to the fact that they are exactly 11 light years away, which means that a transmitter in that area might be returning our signals 22 years late? If we are being signaled and visited by sentient beings from space, what kind of creatures are they? All the credible witnesses, including a veteran police officer of fine repute in Socorro, New Mexico, described the creatures as small, man-like fellows, less than four feet tall, wearing shiny space suits and transparent helmets, much like our own spacemen in miniature. Where do they come from? Nobody knows yet. Why don't they contact us? Well, we have shot at them with cannon, rifles, pistols, shotguns, and guided missiles. They may regard this action on our part as unfriendly. When will they contact us, if ever? The fact that they are still with us after all these years probably means that they intend an eventual contact. A study of their past performance indicates that we are in the closing phases of a long and careful surveillance. At this pace, contact may occur in the next two or three years, or it could come tomorrow. The more we study the evidence that is being assembled all over the earth, the more inescapable the conclusion that man had best prepare himself for the greatest event in human history. The realization that we are about to contact or to be contacted by sentient beings from elsewhere in the universe. The late General Douglas MacArthur said that this confrontation would be the greatest challenge man ever had to face. Are we ready for it when and if it comes? Frank Edwards reporting.